But that was interesting. I, would, I saw uh, a news item with some supposed expert talking about this and saying, well, it, it's entirely up to pe people whether they should wear, wear masks or not. It shouldn't be mandatory. <laughs> but this is ridiculous. It's, it's a, so the assumption is that the mask is there to protect you. And, and everybody yeah. says it's not. It's to protect yeah. other people. So exactly, that's what it, yeah, yeah. it's just. But they, you know, they, they, this was on a, a news outlet in America and completely unchallenged. Yeah. They think, God, and if that's the standard of 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 debate, then mm -hmm. quite clearly, and obviously, if your president says, "Well, it's, not, it's up to you whether you wear a mask," it's mm -hmm. just appalling disinformation. Mm -hmm. But. Well, the disinformation is not the thing that's appalling. The, the appalling thing is that a great number of people actually believe it and, and uh, often believe it in the face of, of you know, obvious um, facts to the contrary. Uh, and, you know, it's just a, a deeply embedded tribalism that, that basically takes over all their, their cognitive facilities. Uh, and 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 this is where this is this is humanity. This is what yeah. you know a great deal of you know a, a great number of proportion of humanity is like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well. So, that, that, you know, that, that. so the question is, I guess, what do you do with them without sort of mentioning you know final solutions and things like that? Well, I mean, we generally speaking the facilities that people have are sufficient you know, because otherwise they wouldn't be so successful as a as a species so far so far given <laughs> things like this but uh, you know i i think the thing is that it's you ex whilst we accept that only relatively few people use the rational cognitive processes that are available, normally those people are in a position of authority and, mm -hmm. and, and therefore the, you know, the, the tribalism can be, is okay because you just listen to the person who's in authority and you accept their word for things. It's yeah. when the people in authority are clearly not rational and mm -hmm. deliberately not rational, you assume. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. Well, maybe not they just make... the, 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 no, no, well, it's rational. It is, there is some rationality, but the rationality is, is, um, um, comes out of uh, a desire for power, control, and wealth. Uh, you know, the, no, the, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure of that because it, it, with, with Trump at the moment, everything that he's saying, everything that he's he's acting towards in order to gain support can only affect his the, his supporters that he has already and that is a looks to be a maximum of 40 percent he, he has to have people who are not his natural supporters mm -hmm. and nothing he says it seems is attracting those people so that's why I can't, it doesn't look rational to me. It doesn't um, look as though yes, it's well, thought thing, through. Though. He's not actually needing their support. I mean, when people do not vote, you uh, might, well, you, yeah. you, you're affected. Because remember that the, 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 the American president in this case, leaving aside other so-called democracies, um, he was elected by 20, around about 25% of all eligible American voters. So in other words, only 50% of all eligible voters voted. And 25% of those obviously voted for Trump. So this is not, you know, representative of... No, no, but, you, but of the people who will vote at the moment, it is, it's evil. And it, it, it was, uh, yes, but the, th the question is, why don't they vote? And I, I, think, I guess this is something which I, I, mean, I used to deal with you know, decades ago with uh, you know, being a sort of a constant 
uh, electoral campaigning within Australia and all the states and everything. Now, you know, for years and years, I was just in total campaign mode, for shifting from state to state and the federal, because uh, all the, the elections are, are at different times, they can come at any time. Uh, but the, the thing is, I mean, well, number one, in Australia, voting is compulsory. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not a right, it, it's, a, it's a responsibility. You've got to vote, you know, and if you don't get, if you don't vote, you get fined. So that, that's, you know, that is one huge, you know, difference. But the question's always, I mean, is always, you know, even though people vote, they can actually vote for nobody. You know, they can just sort of ah. go into the, the voting booth, screw up their paper or write, write some rude words on it, and uh, that's it, that their, their responsibility has been discharged. Now, I keep a very close eye on those sorts of people. Uh, and when I was a campaigner, um, and, and I should add here that I've never voted in my life. So, <laughs> but having said that, um, having said that, uh, I kept a very close eye on that number because you know we had campaign uh, uh, canvassing and polling and all sorts of other things going on. So I could have a look at these things, and look at, of course, the actual results of elections and by elections and what have you. And and uh, yeah, I always kept. I always my winning side was 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 the invalid votes. I used to always look at the invalid votes, the proportion of invalid votes. That was my candidate, was you know, invalid votes. And you know, normally it would be, you know, you know, for a federal election, about say 5% would be informal votes uh, that, that couldn't be counted for some reason. But in other elections, it could be 10 or even 15%. So the question is, and, and that can really mean the difference between somebody winning and somebody losing. Yeah. Now, when, when you're, you've got people who've got no one to vote for, as what happened is, you know, what happened in, in, in the US and, and more than likely in, in the UK as well, when people don't have any, anybody to vote for, they don't vote. And so basically, and, and generally that's on the progressive side, on the side where, where people have you know, aspirations for you know, their, you know, their political leaders, whereas on the conservative side, there is no such aspiration. Uh, so, so they just by default, you know, always, always get uh, a fairly solid block of votes consistently. Uh, whereas on the progressive sides, uh, you, have to, you have to get people interested. People have to want to vote. And if they don't vote, then you lose. No matter how many people might support you in, in polling and, and, uh, and in fact, uh, when it comes down to elections, pe people will not, not vote if, if they have no one to vote for. And that's what have happened in the US, although certainly people just didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton because they just didn't like her. Yeah. And that was all there was to it. She was completely yeah. uninspiring. Um, yeah, so absolutely. But I mean, there, there were, and the, but that isn't the case now. That Biden doesn't mm -hmm. have much of a personality to dislike. And, mm -hmm. and he's, yeah. and he also he's very old and mm -hmm. Trump's initial tactic was to emphasize his 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 age, and that's turned out to be mm -hmm. a big mistake because yes. the people who are regular voters are old, and they don't like to be told that because they're old, they are in some way um, frail and I incapable of um, uh, doing running a, doing a role. And, mm -hmm. and so that seems to have backfired. That seems to be, and so, again, it, it doesn't seem, well, my point was that it doesn't seem to be rational that what Trump is doing, just focusing on people who would vote for him in any case, is not the way to get elected. It might have worked last, but even last time, there were enough people in the middle who were prepared to give him um, the, what they call the independent voters who are prepared to vote for him. And those people mm -hmm. are being put off by his, um, his very focused attention on what, just one side of an argument. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's becoming more and more racist, it's becoming more and more authoritarian, more and more law and order, and that is not what appeals to 
the sort of the people in the middle, floating voters, the independents. So that's why I'm not sure about this his his level of rationality. And I think that it it will get close. It will soon there will be more Republicans who will distance themselves because they mm -hmm. see themselves. They see it's going to they're going to lose, but they want mm -hmm. to keep their political position and they don't really want to have to af after this to say yes I was a big supporter of Trump they don't want that on record <laughs> as being something yeah. that is going to be brought up in interviews so yeah. at the moment they're keeping quiet because they don't want those quotes to come back at them and I suspect mm -hmm. they'll it won't be long before they change and say things which are not supportive mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll see. I mean, I, and, uh, but that, that's why I was thinking that it doesn't it doesn't appear to be a, a, a rational perspective. So, but then I, I sort of becoming to think that maybe he isn't a particularly rational person. So well, that was my oh, point about the, the you know the the the, the process of um, of thinking and working these things through. That we t we we tend to think that we put people who do think rationally in positions of power and therefore we're prepared to accept what they say and follow them without having to think mm -hmm. for things through for ourselves mm -hmm. well you know trump does ap appeal to it i mean it's completely ap appealing to, to emotions there's certainly no rationality there's, yeah. no, there's no logic it, it's pure you know hatred um, you know, ha hatred is a, is a great unifier. You know, it's uh, you know, been used throughout history. There's nothing better to unite people than, than a mutual hatred. And the mutual hatred in, in this case is, is um, well, in my mind, political correctness. That is, that is, that is the, the focus of, of anger and, and, uh, and a lot of yeah, hatred within within not just well within the West generally, I would say. Um, but there's just especially this is especially from you know lower educated people or people who haven't you know haven't either haven't had an education or or who are perhaps incapable of being educated. Uh, perhaps just being sick and tired of being judged and and told what to do and what to think by by you know right-thinking uh, so-called leftists uh, and that's been going for on and that, that resentment has been building up for years and so you know unifying people with hate is is the rationality that is what it's that that i think that is where the rationality lies is an, is an appealing to that to that you know resentment uh from from uh, you know often you know, lower working class and, and worse people on the, on the on the on the economic scale, who are sort of sick of being lectured and uh, being told how to think by 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 you know so-called liberal do-gooders. That's how they perceive it. So, you know, that's that's what uh, I think tr Trump and, he, and his cronies are, are basically mining. That they're mining that that deep well of, of uh, hatred and resentment and using that as as the as the uh their way to power yeah i i don't disagree i my point is that it's not a deep enough well to win this next election no i don't think so and and that's why it doesn't seem sensible i mean what and you just it doesn't it's not going you know <laughs> Clear at the moment, it's not working, and it seems to be creating the opposite effect because his ratings are going down. And there's no the only thing that will change things is well, something sort of miraculous, really. I, and and it doesn't look as though there's anything that could make that happen. Everything looks as though it's going to be worse, not better. So it would be better not you know, to stop digging the hole if you wanted to win the election. So anyway, but, but I'm, the other point, the point you were making about the level of 
hatred or hatred being a unifying factor. Um, I think I mentioned this book that I read, I can't remember what it's called now, um, which had put forward this other a, a sort of completely opposing theory um, about the nature of humans and sapiens, homo sapiens, as a species. And that, in fact, we were generally a much more um, uh, friendly um, and sympathetic species than we've been given credit for. And the, the premise of the book was that the, the change came when we changed from being hunter-gatherers to um, mm. to settled um, to farmers, yeah, agriculturalists, agriculturalists, Agri agriculturalists. And, and and that was yeah. okay for the first for the for the very beginning because you had plenty, but as soon as there were more people than there was agriculture, and you had to expand into um, less um, uh, fertile lands, then you had to work harder, and it became a less desirable way of living than hunter gatherer but by that time everybody had forgotten how to be successful hunter gatherers and so they were stuck and i've just summarized the book here but it it, <laughs> it, it sort of gets to the stage where you to, to now where we're back into a situation where for great majority of people um, they have more uh, or, or less difficult lives and they have more time for leisure more time for reflection uh, mm -hmm. more time for entertainment and this is allowing the the, the deep-seated nature of humanity to um, to to rise again and I, it was quite it was quite a, a interesting argument and i and i and <clears throat> the there was a quite a, a very interesting term that he used and and he called it ho homo puppy and he, he suggests the reason why we're like we are given his hypothesis is because we have self-evolved into selection of attractive qualities so that rather than just being a, a sort of raw survival, you know, the, the survival of the fittest, the reason that the level of fitness is partly to do with uh, likable qualities. Mm -hmm. And he, gave, he gives the analogy of dogs. And he said that if you were to select dogs, you would not select the most aggressive and the most difficult to manage, to breed. You would select the ones which were uh, more amenable uh, because their temperament was more um, acceptable. And so what we've ended up with, with dogs and puppies, is a, a, a breed of a species which is very likable. Infantile. Yeah, but not. They've still have lots of the same qualities that other dogs. Oh yes, have. but the, 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 one of the side effects of selecting for good behaviour is 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 you're basically uh, turning them into to infants. And, and yeah, it's, well, actually, yes, there, there is there is that to it. Absolutely, there is that to it. And he talks, but he and the interesting, he talks a lot about play. And about the nature of that we like to play, and that you know, pup, and I think this is where puppies come in. And he also talks about bonobos, um, which are also very playful and very sociable, as opposed to chimpanzees, which are not. Mm -hmm. And he's he's presenting the argument that in fact we belong to a, a a selection process which is probably closer to that of dogs and dogs as pets and bonobos mm -hmm. 
than of chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And it is that underlying nature which is actually what we are. It's not that we are hateful, miserable people. We are, in fact, at the base, um, friendly and uh, sociable, and have what we would call, I don't know, I think good, good and bad doesn't really come into it, but we have particular qualities which are as a result of that process of, of this sort of mm -hmm. self-selection process. And it, it's mm -hmm. quite an interesting argument. And it, it comes back to sort of from a Dharma perspective. One of my questions all the way through the, the, my interest in uh, Dharma, which is, is compassion something that you are supposed to learn, adapt, adopt to work out this is a way of being or is it actually something that we are anyway and that that's just the way we are and what's happened is that because of the nature of the way that societies have developed um, that we have that there's a veil has been pulled over the top of that and because I've always struggled with this idea of, you know, to be compassionate. It was the, the, the suggestion that somehow you have to understand that this is the way to be. And I thought, yeah. well, that's a really tricky thing to do. Like, how could you possibly teach that? Because it's mm -hmm. a, it's an, it's a, it's an inborn emotion. And getting back to Trump, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be very interesting to see this book that his niece has written she is suggesting yes. that he he lacks these mm -hmm. facilities and mm -hmm. that's to, to me it would be a good example of how something is it, it's actually an argument for this guy's case this guy got wrote this book because it says you know that would be if you don't have those qualities if for some reason you are maladjusted then and you rise to power then it could be a real problem because mm. you know we because of the nature of the way that society's structure is. But anyway, I, I, I think it's quite an interesting perspective, and I, th and I feel it relates to um, questions about the Dharma, and questions, particularly mm -hmm. things like the Eightfold Path, which I've always had a problem with, as if you have to learn these rules, you have to... <laughs> Yeah. These are the things that you need to do, and I think, well, is that can that really be the case? I mean, I, the the first three tasks I think are very sensible because that's not something that is mm -hmm. intuitively understandable. Yeah. But you mm -hmm. you read it, and you think, ah, yeah, yeah. actually, yeah. I, that works. I can do that. Yes. But yeah. how to live? You would sort of think, well, are you telling me I should live differently than the, than I? Um, than the, the, my nature should I can mm. I change my nature it's a bit like saying well, you know, could you become a murderer if you weren't you know that way inclined you know well mm. a bit tricky really I mean it, you know, it's hard work and I'm not sure I could no, I couldn't be mm. a committed murderer well, but, but, but you could you are innately potentially a murderer um, well I mean, I mean as mm. somebody like a, let's call, call it an assassin you know that that would be my profession. You know, I, I, yeah. So could I become um, a, a you know committed? And I would I, I'd have to say no. I don't. I, would, I, I mean, I, it was, there would have to be the circumstances would be, have to be quite tricky for me to enjoy and um, do that as a as a sort of way of life. And in fact, a lot of the arguments in the, this book were of the same thing. He, he points out how few rifles were fired in, in every war that's ever been. People you know, check mm -hmm. afterwards and you find out that hardly anybody shot their rifle. And if they did, they shot to miss. Nobody, yeah. they really, really, it's very, very difficult to get people to kill other people. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, again, it's quite interesting. It's a sort of, you, you really don't want to do this. So your underlying nature is that you're not that type of person. That 
difficult to get people to be like that. Mm -hmm. anyway, there are I'll, certain, you know, there's a certain proportion of people who perhaps are quite the opposite, a very small number, but those very small numbers can, can control a lot of other people. Uh, yes, only in our society. And that's what his point was, that in, in a society like the hunter gatherer it, it wasn't possible because those people couldn't mm -hmm. rise to positions of power. And he gives some examples of, you, you know, you give people one chance, you give them a second chance, and then the third time you stab them in the back because you think, sorry, you just like this is, we can't yeah. cope with this anymore. This is the best way to get rid of you. So mm -hmm. you can tolerate and tolerate and tolerate, and then, yeah, some people are intolerable. But in our society, with, that's not the way it works, that it is possible for those people to rise to positions of authority. And that seems to be what's happened with Trump. Anyway, I'll see if I, I'll, I'll find out the, the, the book and, and uh, yeah, actually, I, I had it on sounds, audio. Sounds very much uh, like both, you mentioned sort of, you know, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, and also about the domestication of dogs. And both those stories have, uh, have been, you know, covered, uh, well, not covered, but, but uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Robert Sapolsky. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and it, well, in the case of the uh, domestication of dogs, I mean, I think the, the classic case is the uh, is a, a Russian fox, the silver fox. Yeah. And how they domest domesticated the, the Russian silver fox over a period of you know, 100 years. That's and right. And turned yeah. from, a, from, a, from a wild animal into a, into, into a baby, you know, a yeah. cute little baby. So and, and you know, that, that the process of domestication was in fact a process of you know removing all, all those traits that were you know um, you know wild or, or or aggressive towards human. But in the in the in the process, of course, they you know inadvertently sort of you know ruined the coat and <laughs> so they're no longer useful as as fur animals um, because they you know, along the way lost that the, 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 those genes. Uh, well, indeed, it, but it depends what we mean by useful. And that's the, I think that's the point, is that, what, that it sort of gets back to what's good and bad. But I think what this, what this book did, because that story is in there as well, he, he's taken lots of these stories and used them in order to support his hypothesis. Another one is Lord of the Flies. Have you, are you familiar mm. with the book? The uh, about, about 50 years ago, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, he, because that undermines the theory completely, uh, because that's what happens if you leave, you know, boys alone on a desert island. So he, that completely mm. is the opposite of the, the premise. And mm. so he, researched that and he found out that Golding, who, the guy who wrote it, was a highly disturbed individual and admitted that he would have, if he was a German, he would have been a Nazi and, and that he, he sort of was aware of his, his own depression and his own odd makeup. So this chap who tried to find if there were, were any examples of a real Lord of the Flies, where people had been, mm -hmm. young people had been isolated. And he, he found, it, in fact, happened, it happened somewhere um, in the, somewhere off Fiji, I think it was. And, they, and he, 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 he found out all about it. And he turned, it turns out that there were six boys, I think, that were isolated for 18 months or so on an island, mm -hmm. and which was not a conducive um, for survival. But they did survive, and they uh, cooperated. So, yeah. and and they are now lifelong friends. And and it, mm -hmm. so it was the opposite of Lord of the Fries. And it, so he presents that actually. So this is the actual. This is actually how we get on, what we do, mm -hmm. rather as opposed to well, a fiction. Well, and that, no, but the I fiction think, think of, the, of Lord of the Fries has been very um, influential in mm -hmm. um, influencing us to think this is how we are. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a binary here, which, you know, people, you know, I guess, go from one extreme to the other. You know, the, the first extreme is, you know, um, tribalism, or the, you know, negative tribalism. 
Uh, the, the other aspect is the altruism and cooperation that uh, is a feature of the species. And, and uh, people can't seem to reconcile, you know, that you know, both of these things are in us. It's not, it's not just, you know, we are one, we are not the other. We are, in fact, you know, a tribal species. We are also a cooperative species. So, you know, that, that's, I think, sometimes missed is, is the fact that we're not one or the other, we are both. And the question is, you know, how much of one are we? Um, you know, obviously, tribalism has its has its um, benefits. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it it brings people together. And I mean, have you heard of Dunbar's number? Um, I don't think so. Dunbar's, Dunbar's number. Is that, Dunbar. Is it 100, 100, 150. Oh, oh, Dunbar's the number of people, number. yes, that you, so you yes, know yes, who, yes. yes, yeah, I didn't realize that. The, the, the actual number doesn't actually matter, but there is yeah. a number uh, at which point, you know, you, you can no longer keep track of, you know, uh, who's in your, your immediate tribe anymore. Uh, and so we have to sort of invent all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, moral or, 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 or belief structures to, so that we can actually tie in more people into our tribe uh, that, that, that goes beyond that number. Uh, so, you know, that there's a basic element of tribalism that, that's innate within, within humans. Yeah, although there is, this guy had an interesting perspective on that as well. And that was that that number is can become relatively constant in our society because we stay in one place and the people around us stay in one place and so you your number of people are geographically located close to you and therefore don't change a great deal mm -hmm. but if you're a hunter gatherer they change a lot because there are the people that you are with who probably don't change much but that's a, probably a relatively small group and you come across other people all the time because you are mm. moving around you're not staying in the same place and they're moving around so your your number of people is constantly changing and you're constantly reevaluating all the new people that you meet as to whether they're acceptable mm -hmm. and that they can become part of that group and that mm. is an interesting way of looking at this so that the tribalist aspect might be more of a state of because of the nature of our civilizations rather than the nature of the species and that if we the more we travel which it seems to be the case the more we travel the more um well our group changes the, the, the people that are in it but also our attitudes change we are much less likely to be I guess, you know, to think of other people as being um, in some way inferior if you spend considerable amounts of time with them because mm. you realize that this can't be the case because I, you, know, you, you live there. Now, I'm not mm. sure that, you know, that I'm sure there are examples of that not being the case, but it does seem as though um, it, it's, it's interesting to think of us as to where we were before civilization or the the settled status of civilizations and then mm -hmm. that and that is a, a deeper underlying um, genetic disposition mm -hmm. anyway look gary i'm this yeah. is it's great to see you but i'm gonna have to go because i'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna have to finish off this house because as i say we're yep. driving back tomorrow okay um, okay then well i'll, I'll I'll see if I can uh, find this book and I'll just send it to you because yeah, uh, it, it, yeah. it's on Audible and uh, the, yeah. know, speed speed listening, you'll get through it quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, send it to me. Yeah, will do. Okay then. Cheers. Okay. Great to see you. Yeah, and maybe see you next week. Good. Okay. See you then. Okay then. Cheers.